Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Glad you're with me this morning. Hope you had a wonderful week, a good Sunday morning kickoff, and you're ready to get into some things today that I think just may rock your cosmos. So hang on. Uh, Hebrew says that he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. So I think I'm going to do a little bit of shaking this morning. I hope you're ready for it. Uh, listen carefully today because I'm going to I'm going to encroach on some things that are kind of accepted right now, even in grace communities, finished work among finished work groups and people that may <clears throat> just bring a little bit different slant and help you to get over the hump of no dualism. That's what I'm after. I, I don't want you to see you and God as being separated in any way, shape, or form. By the time I'm done this morning, what I want to lay out for you, you're probably going to have to, to crockpot this a little bit. You're going to have to let it stew, let it cook over, because I'm going to, I'm going to move you a little bit today. I'm just going to tell you that right up front. All right. I want to start today with John chapter 14, verse 20, powerful verse of scripture. And please listen to the end, because this, this, teaching is going to build right to the end. So if you can't listen to all of it now, make sure that you come back and listen to the finish of it. In fact, I would probably recommend you listen to it two or three times because you're going to hear some things in there the second and third time that you didn't hear the first time. All right. Are you ready to, are you ready to get shaken a little bit this morning? I, I love to do this because when the father shakes me, I shake you. That's the way it works. He reveals to me, he messes with me. I come and reveal and mess with you. John chapter 14, verse 20, familiar verse. <clears throat> oftentimes, excuse me, oftentimes I like to start with the known and then move to the unknown. So let's start with something that we think we're familiar with. John chapter 4, verse 20, Jesus said this, <clears throat> At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now let me read that again. I want you to let this sink in real slow. At that day, you will know that I'm in the Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. I think that verse, <clears throat> to me, is very center. It's a heartbeat of the gospel. <clears throat> I don't think any of us, any of us can debate the fact that in that verse, Jesus is revealing that he and the Father are inseparable. There is no distinction between the Son and the Father in that verse. He said, in that day, you're going to know. This is the day that I think that we are to take this and drive it down just a little bit deeper than we have before. So let's, let's, let's assume that there's absolutely no distinction between the Father and the Son. He said, in that day you'll know that I am in, blended, merged, one with the Father. And then he reaches out and he grabs us and he brings us into that circle of unity, that circle of union, and says, at that day you'll know that I'm in the Father. But let me hit it a little further, Jesus says, and you'll know that I'm in you and that you're in me. Well, if we're in him and he's in us and he's in the Father, then guess where we're at? We're in the Father also. So he brings us into that circle of unity. He brings us into that circle of union where there is absolutely no separation. Now, you've heard that a lot of times. You've heard a lot of teaching. I know that there are other teachers that hit on the fact that there's no separation. But I think we need to get a full understanding of what this full union is and why it's so vital to our spiritual life and more importantly, why it's important to our development. If I'm going to bring you to the measure and bring myself to the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ, then I've got to, I've got to eliminate any, any glimpse of separation. And one of the reasons that this is a difficult obstacle for us to get over is because separation has been drilled into most of us all of our lives in church, all of our spiritual lives. We've heard everything begin with separation. We begin as sons of Adam separated from God. We begin our sins separated us from God. And so the, the new normal acceptable phrase is this. The new normal acceptable is union with distinction. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess with that a little bit this morning. I'm going to challenge that concept of union with distinction distinction. Now, I, I will admit that union with distinction does bring us closer than what past concepts have. Past teachings from many people have brought us into this no duality, no God and me, no God separated from me. Uh, you can't read John chapter 14 verse 20 and come up with any degree of separation. So the new acceptable term union with distinction moves us closer to duality. But when you throw a word like distinction in there at some level, then you're going to say there's separation. There is a distinction. 
Now the distinction, if, we, if I were to define distinction, we say union with distinction. If you're going to say that, then you're going to be able, you're going to say that my drink is too hot and too cold. It can't be both. The word the word union means a uniting or joining together as one. It means united, a merging, a coming together. And that's what Jesus was hitting at in John chapter 4 verse 20 that there's only one. There's only union. Um I thought this week of a good illustration, at least it was a good example for me. When I was growing up, I loved to eat ice cream. I still love to eat ice cream, but when I was growing up, I probably ate a bowl of ice cream most every day of my life. And here's what I did with the ice cream, vanilla ice cream. I would take Hershey's syrup and put it on top of my ice cream. Then I would take a spoon and I would, I would stir the vanilla ice cream with the chocolate syrup. And if I would do it long enough, the consistency, the, the chocolate syrup would totally unite. It would totally merge. It would come in union with that vanilla ice cream so that when I was done stirring it, I just loved the flavor of that Hershey's chocolate and vanilla ice cream stirred. All right? And it would, when I was done, the Hershey's chocolate would be a little lighter due to the vanilla ice cream and the vanilla ice cream would be a little darker due to the Hershey's chocolate. But there would only be one consistency there. It almost looked like a chocolate malt and a chocolate shake. So the two had come into union. You could not separate the Hershey's chocolate. The day of separating the Hershey's chocolate from the vanilla ice cream or the vanilla ice cream from the Hershey's chocolate was over. They become one. The two had become one. They were, they were united. They were in union. Now, the word distinction means not the same, separate. It means a distinguishing of a difference. There was no distinguishing of a difference in that chocolate syrup in that vanilla ice cream. They were in full union. There was no distinction. They, they were not separated. They, they were, there was no distinguishing mark anymore of one being separated from the other. And so when we, when we come into this idea of that we are in union with distinction with the Father, what we're really saying is there is a separation at some level. There is a separation at some level. Now I'm going to bring some clarity to, to that this morning. So don't get all bent out of shape with me. Don't, don't say that I'm saying something I'm not today. I'm going, to bring, I'm going to bring some clarity, but just hold on. I want to get rid of this term of union with distinction. Let me, sh let me show you what you really are. Let me, show you, let me show you what the union actually has produced. I want to read four or five verses from Psalm chapter 8, and I want to read out of the Passion Translation. Passion Translation. It says in... Uh, uh, let me pick it up with verse, let me, let me start with verse 4. Compared to all his cosmic glory, why should you bother with puny mortal man or to be infatuated with God's sons? Yet what honor you have given to men. You have created them a little lower than Elohim. Now I want you I want you to understand the created a little lower than Elohim. And in your in your King James or your New King James it says angels. The the translators I guess were actually afraid to say what the original says, but the word um angels is actually the word Elohim which means creator God. So he has created us a little lower than created God. Now just stay with me this morning because I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to really lay this one down for you. You have what what honor you've given to men. You've created them a little lower than created than than Elohim, than the Creator God. So that's His doing. That's what He has done for us. You have crowned the kings and queens with glory and magnificence. You have delegated to them. And I want if 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 you were to read your Bible in passion, I would want you to underline delegated to them. That's extremely important to understand at this point. You have delegated to them mastery over all you have made, making everything subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers, all the created order and every living thing of the earth, sky, and sea, the wildest beasts, and all the sea creatures. Everything is in submission to Adam's sons. Now, they actually threw Adam's sons in there, uh, Adam's. So let, I'm just going to say, okay, that, that's a good translation. So if this was true of first Adam's sons, if this is the way God originated, if this was the way God created to begin with, under the dominion and rule of Adam's sons, think how much more it must be under last Adam's brothers. 
Here's what I want you to see several things from this. I want you to see that he creates a little lower than Elohim and he and he delegated to us absolute dominion and power over everything in the earth. Now this conf this confirms when you read that passage, you can't get away from the fact that this confirms the essence of our being. Here's your essence. Here's the essence. Here's the core of your very being. You are in the image and the likeness, he says, of Elohim himself. And I'm going to go back to Genesis and read it for you. We have been created in the image and the likeness of Elohim. And Elohim then breathed the very, his very being into us, the breath of life. What is that? Genesis 2.7. breathed into man the breath of life, spirit, pneuma. So our, our core essence is image and likeness of God that is filled with the, with the life of God, with the breath of God. He created his image and likeness that blew into us his very, his very being. That's the essence. That's the core of our being. The breath that came into us was the Zoe life, the life of God. Same essence. Same quality. You can't, you can't say the essence was different. So there is no distinction in essence. There's no distinction in quality. The core nature that you and I carry with us is the Father himself. He did it. He delegated it to us. Right? He, this was his working. This was his doing. But now listen to him. I do, let me clarify this a little bit for you. This is going to help you. But I, I, I want to lay down this morning so strong that there is no, there is no distinction in union. The way he set it up is oneness. You cannot read, honestly, you cannot read John 14, 20 and say there is any degree, nth degree of separation, no matter how far you want to carry it. But now listen to me carefully. I'm going to make just a little shift here. But in the kingdom of God, in the government of the kingdom that you and I live in, you occupy a little lesser function, a little lesser position. That's just what he said here in, in, in um, Psalm chapter 8. You created him only a little lower than Elohim. Lower in what way? Lower in essence? Absolutely not. Lower in nature? Absolutely not. Image and likeness of God. Breath of God into us. What, what is the lower part? It's a difference in function. It's a difference in position. But you are not lower than essence. Now I got, I got to drive that because I want you to start seeing yourself correctly. You cannot see yourself correctly if you're going to give yourself to any degree of separation. And that's what we've done by saying union with distinction. We still said there's separation. There's difference. There is no difference. The only difference in us is, is our function, our position. Let, let, me, let me read that fifth verse and that sixth verse again. You've crowned the kings and queens with glory and magnificence. You have delegated to them. He, this is our position. This is our function. You have delegated to them mastery over all you have made, making everything subver subversant, subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bears. All the created order and every living thing of the earth, sky, and sea. That's your function. That's your position. Now that's different than God's. God is the creator of all things. But the essence, the nature that you and I carry is one with the Father. It's like, it's like this. In the army, a general and a, and a captain are both equal as soldiers. They're both army soldiers. But they are different in function. They are different in position. Their rank is different. Their, their authority is different. But their identity is exactly the same. They're still soldiers. They come under that one banner. They are still soldiers. It's, it's, it's not that their identity is different. Their function is different. Now, my function is different than the God of the universe. I'm not going to, I would never debate that. I'm not, I'm not responsible to govern the cosmos. Thank God. That's his responsibility. That's his function. That's what he is supposed to be about. That's not my rank. That's not my position. But that has nothing to do with my identity. It has nothing to do with my union with him. It's function and position. Now, Paul, Paul really nailed this down. 
Paul had some good things to say about this, and Paul, Paul understood it. Let, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You may have never heard this before. I just may reveal something to you that will clear up some things in your thinking. I want to get you to where you don't see there's any distinction, there's any difference, there's no separation between you and the Father. And this union with distinction thing has graded on me, and I feel like the Lord has shown me what, what we can say. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog this morning that doesn't mess with our, our union, but yet shows position. Now watch what Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He said, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some, some who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not, are not wise. <clears throat> but we will not boast beyond our measure. We will not boast beyond our job description. We will not boast beyond our position. We will not boast beyond who, who God made us to function as. But within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere reaching even to you. For we are not extending ourselves beyond our sphere as though not teaching you, for we came even to you with the gospel of Christ. Not boasting, he says in verse 15, of things beyond our measure. That in order men, that in in order men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, you shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. So Paul is saying, I'm not I'm not going to boast beyond my measure. He said, I'm not moving beyond the sphere of what God has assigned to me. Now that word measure that's used in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 to 15, the Greek word is metron. It means a limited portion of authority. Are, are you with me? A limited sphere of influence. And he uses the word sphere several times here because he's drawing and saying, look, this is, this is my lane. See, I know my lane. I know what I'm doing. There are things that's outside my lane. You know, fixing things is outside my, my, my sphere, my measure. I have no, I'm, not able, I'm not good at fixing things. I got a brother in, in Michigan, and he can fi he's really good at fixing things. He can, he can work on the motor, on his, on his Harley. He can, he can do things around the I can't. I have no absolute that's outside of my measure of rule. Measure means metron, limited portion. That measure, that, that it, it, it increases as we ascend spiritually, as we come to more spiritual understanding, that measure grows as we awaken to our identity as divinity. And I think your measure is going to increase this morning if you will listen to me and not make distinction. Stop this union with distinction business. There is no distinction. God took of himself. He took his image and likeness and, 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 and created us. And then he set us up and he blew the breath. His, his very essence, his very being, you cannot separate that. He created us with no separation, but we have a different, different function. The Father and I have a different function. Jesus and the Father had a different function. Jesus said, would you admit this morning that Jesus is absolutely God? And yet Jesus said, the Father is greater than I am. He said, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. Jesus knew what his position was. He knew how to function completely within his metron, his measure of rule. Right? The President of the United States is no different than I am. We were both born here. We're both citizens. We both have the same rights under the Constitution of the United States of America. We're both equal in essence. But there's a difference in our metron. There's a difference in our, our sphere of responsibility. There's a difference in our authority. He's the President of the United States. I don't make the decisions and the choices he does. But when he's no longer president of the United States, he comes back and his metron then comes back to what mine is. He has no more authority in anything than I do. He can give opinion. He can give advice and counsel. But in, at the end of the day, his authority is no different than mine, although now it is because of his position, of his function. See, we, we got to get a full grasp of this thing of union. Union without distinction. Nobody has taught about the difference between identity and function. We've looked at God and we've said, look, God, God functions as the master controller of the universe. He created all that is and he, he's the one that governs all that is. And that's not me, so I must, I must be different than him. No, you're no different than him. Jesus said in Philippians chapter 2, he said, or was said about Jesus from Paul, he said that Jesus, 
uh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Equal with God was his identity. Making himself of no reputation was his function. It was his job description. We all within the body of Christ have a different job description. Does that, does that mean our essence is different? Because I teach at the digital cathedral and you teach school, does that make our essence, does that make our quality of being different? Absolutely not. We have a different role. Does that make my role greater than your role? Absolutely not. If you're an auto mechanic, you flip hamburgers, or you're the apostle of the northern hemisphere, it matters little. Your essence and quality of being is absolutely the same. You just function and have a different job description. So we've got to get a grasp on this. I think it's one of the last humps that we got to get over to actually seeing ourselves the way the Father sees us. So what is my function? Here's my function. All things are possible to him that believes. That's my function. That's my, my, my job description. All, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's my function. That's my position. My identity is image and likeness of God, filled with his breath, his spirit, in full union with him as much as Jesus was in John 14, 20. I'm going to keep coming back to that. Jesus makes sure that we don't draw a distinction. I'm in the Father. You're in me, I'm in you. That means the three of us are in union as, as fully as you can define union. We're in union together. Anything less of my job description, my function, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or all things are possible to me that believes, as I believe, as my revelation grows, my, my, my uh, automatic response to revelation is I believe. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to say all things are not possible to me as a believer, if, if I'm going to say I cannot do all things with, through Christ who strengthens me, then it's because I'm thinking lesser of myself than I should think. See, man, his, his grace is imparted to me. His spirit is within me in its fullness. It's within you in our fullness. And we've, we're coming to the place that I think we can finally say, I have no life and no existence apart from him. I died, and my life is hidden. Here's that union. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that what Paul was getting at in, first, in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, when he said that I've been crucified with Christ? It's no longer I who live. It's Christ that lives in me. We're living one life together. I'm living the Christ as me life. And the life I live by faith, I live by by the faith of the Son of God. If you look at that at 20th verse in Galatians chapter 2, in, in, in the King James, it gets the right preposition in there. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I'm living His faith. His faith is my faith. But if you look at the New King James, all of a sudden they put the wrong preposition in there because of a religious influence, I absolutely believe in the, in the translators, that want us to think that it's our faith in Christ that makes the life possible. No, it's not. See, they're, they're still drawing distinction there. They're trying to say, well, I've got to have my faith to live in, in him. No, it's, it's I live by the faith of the Son of God. All right, let, let me take you back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I'm just going to quote it, and this is a Keithley translation. It's close. God said, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. All right, image and likeness, that's identity. That's identity. Image and likeness is identity. Now here's function, here's position. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, everything that creeps on the earth, everything that, that I have created, I'm giving man authority to rule over, to have dominion over. That's function, that's job, that's position. Do, do, do you understand the difference? Do you understand the difference? With, with this in mind, let, let me just further mess with you a little bit. Identity and function come to its fullest um, to its fullest turn in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when, when Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seeking first the kingdom of God and, and then all things being added to us comes out of functioning and position with a good identity. I can't seek wholeheartedly the kingdom of God if I think I'm something lesser than myself. 
I'm going to see, if I, if I don't see myself in full union with the Father, fully in his kingdom, knowing that I've been delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's Son, if I still feel like, man, there's something there that I'm missing, there's, there's a little nth degree that separates me, I will never be able to seek it with all my heart, and as a result, I will not function. The things will not be added to me. See, our thinking has been so perverted, and I keep coming back to church because that's where most of us picked up on this. We were taught that we're lesser than we are. You know what they taught me over, over at the school, over at the preacher factory? They taught me that I was just a human, that I wasn't worthy, that God, God can't even stand to look at me except he, he sees me through Christ. And if you removed Christ, I would be totally distasteful. I would totally be repulsive to him because of my, my humanness and my failings and my sin. See, that's, that's the separation. And we're working a little bit at a time at removing all of that. And we're doing a good job. We're coming a long way. The union with distinction thing is just, is just another baby step of removing separation. But at its heart and its core. And I'm talking to you at the Digital Cathedral because you need to be pace setters in this of removing distinction. John 14, 20. Now, because we have distinction, it affects our prayer life. Because there's that degree of separation. When we pray, we're praying to a God out there. We're praying to a sky God. We're praying to a God that's separated from him. And we're requesting. We don't believe all things will be added to us as we seek the kingdom. Because we're not worthy. We're not good enough. And so as a result of that, we're praying to this distant God to come do something for us. And when we're praying, we're, we're telling him how much we love him. And, and, and forgive us of all of our sins. And we're sorry for all of our disobedience. We're trying to get him to do something for us. For us. And when we come together with other people in intercessory prayer, we beg and plead on behalf of other people. And we're thinking if we could add our faith to his faith, and there's, there's 25 of us with our faith all added together, or 1,000 or 10,000, it gets stronger. And then surely he'll unfold his arms and he'll come out of the sky and he'll come down to where we are and meet us at our point of need. <laughs> Separation. Separation. Jesus lived out of Matthew 6.33. He knew what seeking the kingdom was about. He was always about his father's business. The father's business is carried out in the kingdom, and Jesus knew that. How did Jesus know that? Because his union with the father was absolutely complete. He knew who he was. So when you hear people talking about you need to know who you are, they take it up to a line and they stop. And the stopping point right now is union with distinction. And I'm telling you that you can't have union with distinction. It's got to be one or the other. And I'm explaining to you this morning the difference between identity and function. Paul nailed it, measure of rule. We don't extend ourselves beyond our measure of rule. You know your lane, you get in it, and you run. That's your function, that's your position, but it has nothing to do with the essence of your being. The essence of your being is as much divinity as it was Jesus's. Man, you, Pastor, you sound, you sound like you're getting pretty far out there. Listen, we need to get farther out there. We haven't even scratched the, the surface on who we are as a new creation. We've dumbed it down. We've watered it down. And I'm telling you, the day has come that the cat gets out of the bag and we reach the fullness of the measure of the stature of the Christ. See, the, things were added to Jesus because he knew how to seek the kingdom. He knew his identity. You do not find Jesus one time begging and pleading for God to give him anything. You don't find Jesus interceding for other people. Jesus spoke to them the word of life. He got to the tomb of Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come out of that grave, brother. He spoke the life. Now, here's, here's what arises out of union. Here's what arises out of union. John chapter 3. I want, you to, I want you to pay real close attention to this. This is, this is a man that knows who he is, what he possesses, what he, what he has, and he knows what his function is, his position. Watch, John chapter 3, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. There's identity. The Father loves the Son. When you know the Father really loves you, you know who you are. You see the oneness. You see the union. You see no separation. Now watch the function. And he's put all things into his hands. When you've got everything in your hands, what are you going to ask for? What are you going to beg and plead for? What are you going to intercede for? He's saying, take the things that have been given to you and utilize them. Father loves the son. Has put everything into his hands. That's a man that knows his identity and his position. 
All right, Luke chapter 10. Back it up just a little bit. Luke chapter 10. Luke says pretty much the same thing, but let me just, just read Luke's take on it. Luke chapter 10, verse 22. Jesus said this, and this is in red. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. That's identity. That's knowing who you are. And no one knows who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he whom the Son wills to reveal the Father. That's a, that's a guy that knows his identity. He knows that all things have been delivered to him of the Father, and he knows his function. He has the ability to reveal the Father. Can I tell you this morning that your job is just to reveal the Father? You don't have to set correct doctrine. You don't have to set correct theology. What you need to know is what the heart of the Father is, what the Father is truly like, is revealed in Jesus, and then to simply reveal him to other people. All right, let me give you one more. John chapter 16. John chapter, this all comes out of, of someone that knows identity and knows function. We haven't drawn distinction between identity and function. They're totally separate. Every one of us have a different function, but our identity is the same. John 14, 20, being in him, in God. My life, I died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. That's identity. All right, John chapter 16, verse 15. I'm preaching good this morning. John chapter 16, verse 15. All things that the Father has are mine. Wow, that's identity. Therefore, I said that he will take a mine and declare it to you. So he's saying in essence, I have unlimited resource. There's nothing that I don't have. What does the Father not possess? Jesus said, everything the Father has, he's given to me. Therefore, the spirit of truth... Jesus said, it's going to take what I have, which is everything from the Father, and he's going to break it down and, and, and give it to you. The bullseye, the bullseye of our spiritual life is a total understanding of union. When you come to a full understanding of union, and let me define union like this. It's a full understanding of our complete oneness, a complete understanding of our our identity and divinity with no distinction. No distinction. The Father took the exact essence of His very being. Can you see that? He took the very essence of His being and He, he, he placed that in this clay guy, in this little clay man that He built over here. And He said to that clay guy, I want you to rule. I want you to reign. I want you to have dominion. So the identity was the exact essence that he placed within man. And then the function was to reign, to rule, and to take dominion. Do you see the two working in coordination? And can I tell you, you cannot function of ruling and reigning and taking dominion if there's separation, if you don't understand your identity. Everything you do flows out of who you believe that you be. And God's trying to tell us today who we be. He's trying to tell you that you're exactly like him. Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, identity, but made himself of no reputation, position, function. So along comes religion then, and it has destroyed that. Through generations, a confirmational bias told us that we were separated, teaches us that we're just human. That, that, yeah, you can grow mentally. You, you might become smart and, and, and you might be able to, to, to become a physical specimen that's perfect, but you're always going to be this little dwarf spirit. You're spiritually, you're, ne you're never, you're never going to become like Jesus. Spiritually, there's this separation. So the restoration of all things accelerates as we begin to see who the designer has created us to be. Right? We're starting to, to live it. We're starting to think it. We're starting to hear it. We're like the source of origin. The spirit awakens and he ascends to its full measure. Metron, measure of rule. The spirit within us is awakening and he's, he's arising within us and he's taking us to our full metron. And as he does, we manifest as sons. We cannot manifest as sons of God thinking there is any degree of, dis, of distinction. And this cotton picking thing of union with distinction has, has kept us 
however fine it is in getting us to no duality of God and us, is still at the end of the day, it's got a, a difference between God and us. And I'm telling you, there's no difference in essence. There's no difference in quality. There's no difference in the core of our being. Where, where, we, where we differ is in function, is in job description. His job description is not my job description. I do not want to run the universe, but I do want to know what he's called and set me on the plan to do and then fulfill it. So let's begin to, dis to dismantle all of this, all of this junk that's in us that has tried to make us think that we're separated. Uh, 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 the things that our personal rights have fought to keep, I'm telling you, we're submitting to a life in the kingdom. And as we submit to it, it's something good. Something very powerful is happening all over the planet right now. Men are awakening. They're beginning to see things that they never saw before. And so this old concept of God that we carried around, that he's, that he's out there somewhere, he's separated from us, he's alienated from us, that, is not, that ain't satisfying people anymore because people's eyes are opening. You with me at the Digital Cathedral, think how much your eyes have opened over the last year, two years, five years, some of the 15, 20 years. That prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, I tell you, that thing is on steroids today. Can I read that prayer for you? Because this, this could be in the Christian newspaper today because it's so up to date. Here, you want to know what's going on? Here it is. Paul prayed it. Paul prayed it in Ephesians 1 and verse 16. <clears throat> he says, I don't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. Here's what he prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That spirit of wisdom and revelation is arising in you. You know what wisdom is? Wisdom is the ability to apply the revelation that you see. That's what wisdom is. So as he shows you something, you're able to bring it into your life and to live it out. He said the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation go hand in hand. I got to stop. I could get off on that one and go for an hour. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That Your eyes are opening up today. Aren't you glad your eyes are opening up? Aren't you glad that you're not in that old spiritual religious rut that you were in for so many years? He said that you are being enlightened. He said, well, here's why. That you may know the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his glory and what he has as an inheritance for the saints. Man, we are discovering our inheritance that's what we should enjoy while we live. An inheritance is given to you to enjoy while you live. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So the, the, the power that's going to work in you has the functional ability to rise to the working of his mighty power. But you will never hit that if you think there's separation. Union with distinction, no matter how fine it goes, it is separation. And he's saying without separation, you're going to see that the power that works in you is the power that actually the Father has. That's what he had. So this, this generation is getting revelation like no, no other. They're getting it for themselves. They're learning that they can study and get revelation for themselves. And that is raising, believe me, that's raising havoc with pastors and churches all across the nation. Because they've been the, they've been the favored ones. The, 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 the guy that stands up in front every Sunday morning, he's the one supposed to bring the revelation and everybody else is supposed to nod and say, he has, a, he has a boss, we'll just do what you say. We're learning we can get it for ourselves. This is the first generation to question the dogmas, the doctrines, the theology that went for generations unchallenged, kept us in check, kept us lesser than we were designed to be. And, and if you questioned it, God help you if you questioned it, you were shunned, you were called a heretic, you were excommunicated, you were put outside the church. This is the first generation that are saying to church leaders, prove to me what you're saying. Help me to understand it better. See, we were told that we had to pray the magic prayer. And it's only when we prayed the magic prayer. Then God accepted us. Then God loved us. Then God was our father. When we did something first, then he reacted to us. And so we're looking around today. People are looking around and saying, hey, wait a minute. That, that, that guy over there, he didn't pray the magic prayer. And his life's just as good, if not better, than my life. Tell me about this magic prayer again. What is this supposed to do for me? 
As long as your understanding is darkened, Paul prays, I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. You can pray the magic prayer all day long. But until the eyes of your understanding are enlightened and you see revelation, you're not going to be any different than the guy that didn't pray the magic prayer. Magic prayer is not magic. It may, it may soothe your conscience. It may help you think you've achieved something. But in reality, it does not change your life. What changes your life is the spirit of wisdom and revelation that Paul said you belongs to you. That's what changes your life. We've learned that with grace and with unconditional love. There's no hoop jumping. There's no magic prayer to pray. There's no grabbing on to a sky god and trying to bring him into our world. People have moved from that angry bipolar God that we were so fearful of to a father who gave us before we ever asked. Religion says you got to ask and then God will give. You ask him to come into your heart, he'll come into your heart. You pray and ask him to forgive your sins, then he will forgive your sins. You know what he did? He forgave your sins before you ever prayed. We love him because he first loved us. We didn't choose him, he chose us and ordained us that we would go and produce much fruit. We're finally learning that he has loved us and accepted us the entire time. He's always been our father. Ephesians 4, 6, have you memorized that verse yet? There's one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in all. So this revelation of union, of having one Father, all men have one Father, it has unpacked the fact that there can only be one Father. There's only one source of life, you all. God alone is God, and that God has no religion. He's too big for one religion. You can't hold him in Christian. You can't hold him in, 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 in the Muslim faith. You can't contain him in a religion. He's too big. He's not Christian either. That, that right there, that right there shook some of your cosmoses, shook your world. That he, he's not Christian. Which, which of the 44,000 denominations all claiming to be right and Bible is their source, which one do you think God is? He's too big for that. He didn't send Jesus to start a new religion because he's not religious. We've made him religious, but he's not religious. We've tried to form him in our image and in our likeness and, and dumb him down to where he's like us. No, 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 no. You are like him. He's not like us. You're like him. Jesus came to show us what the Father's really like. He didn't come to show the Father what we're really like. You can't dumb him down. Jesus came to seek and to save that, everything that was dismantled. Every, the, the earth has been messed up. And so the Father sent the Son to reconcile the world, the cosmos to himself. All of the cosmos is fully recognized as reconciled. And, and, and the courts of heaven look at all things, all men, all, all creation and say it has been reconciled. We can stand back today and say, it's all of us here at the digital cathedral that can say, in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being, with or without religion, whether you go to church or don't go to church, if you tithe or don't tithe. Right there, man, I said it. If you tithe or don't tithe, you've still been reconciled. He's open. Tithing doesn't open the windows of heaven. The windows of heaven have already been opened because of what Christ has done for you. He's fully manifested as the life that is in all of us. And apart from him, there is no life. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's all that it is. That's his job description. That's his function. It's not mine. I like how uh, um, Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says it. It says that everything comes from God, goes through God, and returns back to God. Do you see the circle there? From, through, Back to all things. All things. Romans eleven thirty six. 36. Check it out yourself. He's the father of the just. He's the father of the unjust. He's the father of those you think are good. He's the father of those that you think are bad. He's the father of the church. He's the father of the unchurched. He's absolutely no respecter of people. He's absolutely no respecter of religions. And you and I have got to grasp that. It doesn't mess with our identity. It's not going to make us lesser. Are, are you with me? The Father of all is one because there is no one greater. There is only one. There's only one source. There's only one creator. 
He's my father and he's your father. He's your neighbor's father. He's your brother's father. He's your uncle's father. He's my father whether I go to church or don't go to church. He's my that you can run it out as far as you want. You can you can have all the dualities you want. And he brings it right back to one in union. We're in union with him. Father will not and he cannot cast us aside any more than the father casts aside the prodigal. See, I'm working on your identity right now. I'm working on your identity. You can you cannot by your actions make him withdraw from you. You say, well, what about if we fall from grace? If you read the scripture that says you've fallen from grace, you don't fall from grace by your actions of sin. You fall from grace when you come back under the law. So some of you that are watching this morning, you have this, and I just had a good friend do this, and it really, it hurts. They were strong in grace, thought they understood it, thought they had it, but they have now returned back to the law. And so now they're saying they don't believe any of the things that God showed them on the finished work, grace, any of those things, they're back and they're comfortable. They're secure in being told what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. He cannot cast you aside based on what you do. What you, take, what you fall from grace, put yourself back under the law. But the prodigal was never lost to the father. He was never, he was never from the father's mind. He separated himself from the father, but the father never separated from him. Prodigal never lost his identity. Listen. He never lost his identity. He was always still the son of the father. What he lost was his function, his position. And he wakes up one day in a position, in a function, way below what that Jewish boy should have been experiencing. He was feeding, he was feeding himself on the husks of the pigs down in the pig pen. And for a Jewish boy, that's about as low as you can get. Was he still have the same identity? Absolutely. But his function, his function and his position were way less than they should have been. So the, 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 the prodigal can move from the father, but the never, father never moves from the prodigal. So what happened? He finally came to himself. Some of us are coming to ourselves. We're understanding identity, but we're still making distinction because our, our, our job title, our, our um, activity that we've been designed to do is different, is different. And we've translated that to be separation. Union with distinction. No, there's, if you're in union, there cannot be distinction. John 14, 20. I defy anybody to show me any separation or distinction between the Father, the Son, and you in John 14, 20. There is absolutely none. We've created it. And it, it, we keep inching in on it. And so now we're down to where there's just a union with distinction. Get, we're, we're not him. No, you are him. <laughs> it's just your job is different. Your measure of rule, your metron, Paul said. Paul said, I'm not going to stretch myself beyond my measure. I'm not stretching myself beyond my measure. Now, does that change my, the essence of my being? No, I'm still image and likeness of God. Where the, where the breath of God has filled me, I, I, I don't think it robbery to be equal with God, but make myself of no reputation. I stay in that lane that God has created me in. I let him add to the measure as I, as I come to the fullness of understanding exactly who I am. Aren't you glad today that the father never excommunicated that prodigal son? He never punished him. He never even scolded him. When he saw him, he looked every day, he looked on the horizon. And he was waiting for that son to come to himself and understand that his, that, his, that his function, that his position needed to be in match to his identity. And so he returned home. And when the father saw him, he didn't run out. He didn't say, son, if you repent, if you bawl and squall and tell me how sorry you are, I'll let you into the family. He never, the son had a speech all, all planned out. Going to tell the father how sorry he was. Just make me as, as a servant in your household. At least I'll get three, three hots in a cot. If I could just serve, father wouldn't hear any of that. He didn't even let him for a minute repent. That's going to blow up some of your theology right there. The father never even let the son repent. Why? Because the father had already forgiven the son for everything that he had done. He had already, when he gave him his inheritance, do you think the father did not know the son was going to blow it? Of course he knew that. But he let the son go and he let the son figure it out on his own until the son came to himself. But when he came back to himself, he did not punish the son, scold the son, 
ask the son to cry, show him how sorry he was, and then let him into the family. No, the father extended the forgiveness before the son could ever say a word. And the father has extended forgiveness and reconciliation to all of humanity before we could ever say a word. That's our identity. And so now we're learning to function in that. The problem in the story, the drag in the story, was not the prodigal son, it wasn't the father, it was the older brother that looked on that, that prodigal son and said, man, this is not right, that he be restored to everything without, without crying and bawling and squalling. See, I think a lot of us are gonna be surprised at the end of the day when we show up to the party there's going to be a lot of evangelicals that are going to be mad and angry because the father is going to welcome every prodigal into the party. And some evangelicals are going to stand back and say, that's not fair. I bawled, squalled, repented, did all these things. Didn't you see all of that I did for you? And the father's going to look at you and say, you were always with me, son, exactly like the prodigal son. Everything I had was yours. We just read it from your book. It belongs to us. Let me, let me bring this train into the station. I've said so much this morning. We're living in a freedom setting, restoration of all things releasing day. And what's being released to you this morning is the fact that there is no separation. There's, there's union, there's oneness. Where we vary is in our, our function, our job title, the way we operate. The release point of all creation, they're looking for the sons that are living as divinity, that understand their identity and can function and flow in it. They're looking for sons that can stand up and proclaim the universal fatherhood of God, unconditional love without, without exception. They're looking for sons that can proclaim grace apart from any works, mercy that endures forever. And they're looking for sons that know that their identity is divinity with no separation. That's my message this morning. Union without distinction, all right? Those that know that he has breathed into them the breath of life, he didn't breathe into us human life, he breathed into us divine life, and we became a living soul with his mind and his essence. Our whole being, our entire being is God essence. It's divine. It's divinity. And anything that would conflict with that is going to create a war between your spirit and your flesh. I'm done. I've, I've said more than enough this morning. Gone 52 minutes. I try to go 45, 40, 45, but I never hit it lately. Anyway, hope you got something out of this. Listen to it again. There's such depth to this that will set, absolutely set you free to the next level, to the next place, to the next consciousness that you need to know, which is union without distinction. Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday night. Don't forget to hit the subscribe and the like and leave a comment if you'd like to. We'll see you next time at the Digital Cathedral and next Wednesday at the Secret Place, 7 Central on my Facebook page. God bless.